A large web app that I started as a Greenfield project over five years ago on .NET Framework is now running on .NET Core. This is my full experience report on how I migrated. Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you're new to my channel, I post videos about software architecture and design in .NET and things like this related to migrating a large web application to .NET Core. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. All right, so first I want to set a little bit of context about kind of the size of the web app that I'm referring to. So I mentioned large at the very beginning and large to me might be some different scale to you. So I recently ran Endepend on the code base itself for the solution and we're just over 250,000 lines of code. So that's what I'm referring to in terms of scale here. So I do want to give a little bit of background on the project itself, the, the structure of it and kind of a little bit of the architecture. I won't go too deep into it. I'm going to save that for a completely separate video. But you can think of each one of these blue boxes as being a solutions folder. And inside that solution folder, we have separate uh, actual project files. So there's a project for contracts, implementation, and tests. And the gist here is that each implementation project may reference a contracts project, but no other implementation projects. Those contract projects are really just for DTOs, messages that we use, interfaces, delegates, but no actual implementation. So beyond this, each implementation has its own entity framework context with its set of entities. They're not shared. Each individual uh, project, implementation project, has its own. They are not shared. Those live in the implementation. They do not live in contracts. So for example, the middle box has no reference to the database on the very far left. This is important to note mainly because I will be talking about migrating Entity Framework to Entity Framework Core and why this particular uh, setup matters. There's kind of two main entry points to the web application. And because it's a web application, the first actually is what we call the web host. And this was very early on when we started developing this, like I said, five years ago. So we started using Katana in Owen along with HTTP Listener. So this was completely self-hosted. We weren't using IIS. And if you're using Katana, it was really the kind of the precursor to what ASP.NET Core is. It has a very similar startup and the hosting model, uh, which we use the console app. So if you're used to ASP.NET Core now, um, you can kind of view Katana as a precursor, which really helped in our migration. Now our web application was mainly just an HTTP API. And for that, at the very beginning, we were using ASP.NET Web API. That soon, within the first few months, got converted to start using Nancy. So there were some legacy uh, things, maybe the first half year to a year, where we still had MVC uh, Web API controllers, but then everything from there on out started using Nancy. Last piece of the puzzle is this console app that was installed as a Windows service. That was a worker. Basically, it picked up messages from the message broker, which the web host was publishing, or the worker itself was publishing back to the message broker. That was basically dealing with messages for various events that were happening through the system. In the .NET Core 1 era, we didn't really see any need or didn't have much ambition to actually do the migration. But once .NET Core 2 came out and brought back so many different APIs and things like .NET Standard kind of solidified, and a, library, a lot of library authors were making sure their packages were .NET Standard compliant, that's when we really decided to kind of move forward with this concept of, hey, let's see if we can actually do this. One of the very first things we did in terms of kind of this migration journey was migrating our CS proj files to the new SDK style that you're familiar with with .NET Core projects. So I wrote a blog post back in 2017, which is quite a while ago, but things have changed a little bit. I used a little bit of a kind of a manual method now there is this new try convert, which is a .NET global tool, which I recommend checking out. So kind of step one, if anything, is migrating to your, the new SDK CS proj files. The next thing we did was actually create a brand new ASP.NET Core project that was gonna be using Kestrel instead of Katana and HTTP listener. And what we did is we made that reference a sole implementation and contract project that we could then route all traffic to. So what that looked like just visually is in AWS behind our ALB, we just had a new rule saying, hey, if they're going, if any requests are going to these particular routes, then target our ASP.NET Core uh, process. Otherwise, everything else is gonna do as it normally did, which is gonna hit our web house project. 
Now this is actually pretty simple for us because we were already using Nancy, which was supported by Owen. So that we didn't really have to do any conversion of any web API at this point. It was kind of net new stuff, what we were working on, new routes that we were creating in Nancy. We just automatically started putting that behind uh, ASP.NET Core and Kestrel. Now we did have to re-implement middleware that we had in Owen, that we had to add or Katana now to ASP.NET Core. But again, Katana is kind of the precursor. So a lot of the, how you create middleware, the startup file are very, very similar. Now I mentioned ASP.NET Core specifically and not .NET Core is because ASP.NET Core 2.x can actually run on .NET Framework. And the reason for that is because it actually targets .NET Standard 2.0. And if you kind of roll back and look at .NET Standard and where its implementations are, .NET Standard 2.0 is actually available on .NET Framework. However, if you were now going to try to migrate as of current day to ASP.NET Core 3.0, that's not going to work because ASP.NET Core 3 will only run on .NET Core 3. So this was our decision at this time once we kind of heard that might be the situation back then is this was the migration path is to move to ASP.NET Core 2 but still run on .NET Framework. That way we didn't have to change much code. Like I said, we just had the separate project that was um, sitting behind our load balancer rules differently that decided what, to, how to route traffic where. So I'm jumping back to this slide that I showed earlier. And the reason I showed it is because, as I mentioned, each different project or context had its own database context. So for example, we have three different projects here. Um, and each will have its own database context. What we decided to do is to migrate one of them to use Entity Framework Core. At the time, there was no mention of Entity Framework 6 uh, to be able to work on .NET Core. And even if we did wait for that to happen, the MySQL Entity Framework uh, link provider, that whole thing is still a mess in terms of uh, dependencies. So we did try to move some stuff to Entity Framework Core. Obviously, Entity Framework Core doesn't have all the feature set of Entity Framework 6, and in some projects, we can make that work. Now, because Entity Framework 6 now does support working on .NET Core, it was still an issue for us because our migration path was to get everything working on .NET Framework as best we could, and then flip over the runtime to, to build on .NET Core. Entity Framework 6.4, and I believe 6.3, support .NET Standard 2.1. The problem there is that it's only supported by .NET Core 3, and it is not supported on .NET Framework 4.8. So there's no way that we could actually use Entity Framework uh, 6.3 or 6.4 to target because we would be having to use a different version when running on .NET Framework or running on .NET Core. And we didn't want to have that separation. We just want to be able to migrate as our app developed because we were making changes pretty much every day still. So the alternative for us was a project called Entity Framework Classic, which is a fork of EF6 that supports .NET Standard 2.0. So this can actually run on .NET Framework or on .NET Core. So this was a completely a 100% in place ch uh, change. We just changed our package references and we started use the, using this version instead. Once we were running ASP.NET Core for quite a while and still running our old Katana HP listener, we decided ultimately to move everything to ASP.NET Core. And really that was fairly straightforward. It was just a matter of re-referencing everything to ASP.NET Core and removing the web hosts. So it simply was just referencing where we need to, all the proper Nancy modules were picked up and everything started running through ASP.NET Core. It really didn't take much to do it because we had all the middleware in place. It was really just the test bed to make sure everything was gonna work correctly. And then we simply changed our load balancer rules to point all routes at our new ASP.NET Core uh, instance. So now we were completely running on ASP.NET Core, but still running on .NET Framework 4.8. In order to get to .NET Core, we need to make sure that all of our code was .NET Standard 2.0 compliant. And the reason I did this is because if I can make everything .NET Standard 2.0 compliant, I can run, can keep running on .NET Framework 4.8, and I know eventually I'll be able to run on .NET Core 2.0. So to do that, I ran the .NET Portability Analyzer. I've done this, I don't know how many times to the migration 
uh, over the years here. And really it was kind of a task list that gave me all the types that I needed to replace uh, or that I needed to look for alternatives for. There weren't a ton of APIs or types that we were using that were only available on .NET Core that weren't .NET Standard 2.0, uh, but there were a few. So one of them in particular was WF, uh, WCF services or clients that we were generating. However, there is a .NET SVC util that you can use to generate um, your WCF client that is .NET Standard and will run on .NET Core. So that's one of them. The other one is we were using machine key. So anything in system.web or anything that is specific to .NET Framework, you cannot run on .NET Core. Machine key is one of them. And I did have to use the docs here to figure out, okay, how exactly does data protection work in .NET Core? And how do I get rid of machine key? What's kind of my migration path? And for that, that was very specific to our application, but machine key was another one besides WCF clients. So once we got our code pretty close to being .NET standard compliant, the next piece of the puzzle was dependencies. So the .NET portability analyzer doesn't really do a good job at all for trying to figure out the dependencies you have and are there .NET standard compliant versions. So the way that I had to do this um, a couple of years ago or even last year was really to look at the csproj files, look at all the package references, and jump on NuGet to see if the package supports .NET standard. If it did, awesome. There's a new tool that recently came out a couple months ago from AWS, which is I've tried is their uh, porting assistant. And this will tell you whether a package reference that you have, a NuGet package, is supported by .NET Core or .NET standard. There is one thing to take note of when you're looking on NuGet.org about the dependencies you have and whether they support .NET standard. And one of them I had an issue with in particular was no to time. So what I mean by that is if you're looking on NuGet.org, you look up your package and then you look at the dependency, you can see here that it supports .NET standard 2.0, which is awesome because we know then that means that we likely don't have to do anything. This package will continue to work. But there are some differences here. So in this particular case, it also supports .NET Framework 4.5. And when I was building against .NET Framework 4.8, this was actually the package that was being used. Um, and I should say the actual assembly that was being built was the .NET Framework specific one. If you look in the actual NuGet file, uh, which is really just a zip file, you can see that each one of these targets have different binaries or different assemblies. And because of that, the API surface or their behavior might actually be different. So for no to time in this particular case, I had an issue with serialization of one of the particular types that worked completely different when it was under .NET Framework 4.5 or when it was using .NET Standard 2.0. I'm actually looking at an old version here because this is 2.4, uh, 2.48. And in the newest version 3.0, which actually fixed my issue that I had with serialization, it doesn't have that problem at all because no matter where you're building, you're gonna be using the same assembly, which is the .NET Standard 2.0. So again, when you're looking at your dependencies, you wanna see that they're supporting .NET Standard, but you also wanna be looking to see if what version you're currently, or what um, target you're actually using. Are you using their .NET Framework target or are you using their .NET Standard target? Because even though it's in the same NuGet package, there actually can be differences. So I just mentioned runtime issues, which are the worst. Um, a little bit better than that are compile time issues that I experienced, and one of them was specifically with the AWS SDK. So just like I mentioned with multi-targeting packages and them having different assemblies inside of them, they can have runtime issues, but they can also have different API surfaces. The A AWS SDK, specifically with S3 that I noticed, has this, where when we were building under .NET Framework 4.8, there are synchronous methods. So when the S3, so you call put object, that method name exists. But when you're trying to build under .NET Core, it uses the .NET standard target, and there are only asynchronous methods. So instead of put object, that doesn't exist, uh, or at least it's not public. Instead, you have to use uh, put object async. Now, because that's actually somewhat of a big change for async and how kind of pervasive that is through your code base. Lucky for us, it was actually not that big of a deal. But again, you want to get to building code under .NET Core as quick as possible. So if you can run the API uh, portability analyzer or the AWS version of it and 
try to get your code .NET standard compliant so that you can actually target um, in your target frameworks in your CS proj to try to build under .NET Framework 4.8, as well as try to start building under .NET Core. Once we had all of our code supporting .NET Standard 2.0 and all of our dependencies supporting .NET Standard 2.0, what this allowed us to do is build our ASP.NET Core project under .NET Framework 4.8, as well as .NET Core 2.1. What we did at that point was deploy the .NET Core version on for one specific instance besides our load balancer. So what happened is the vast majority of our traffic was still going to .NET Framework 4.8, and through round robin, through our ALB, uh, some traffic was going to the basically just the .NET Core runtime version that was running. This just allowed us to kind of monitor the situation, our logs, performance, make sure everything was working correctly and if we were having any issues at runtime. So after running our ASP.NET Core and Worker with .NET Core for a couple weeks, all we simply did was take out old instances running on .NET Framework and replace those with the new ones running on .NET Core. If you're planning on doing a migration now or you're thinking of it, the path you're gonna take could be a little bit different than the one I have specifically because ASP.NET Core 3 only runs on .NET Core 3. It only supports .NET Standard 2.1, which is only available on .NET Core 2.1 and higher. So you could still target ASP.NET Core 2.1, like I did, which can still work on .NET Framework. And the beauty of that is it allowed us to pretty much run and build our entire app that would ultimately be able to run on both .NET Framework and .NET Core. So if you're doing migration, I hope you found this video helpful. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. Again, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And please subscribe for more software architecture related videos.